Greetings, astrophiles, and welcome to Cosgrove's Cosmos. Today, I'd like to talk about an update to one of the platforms that I use every clear night, the Ascar FRA 400 Astrograph platform. Let's get started. My FRA 400 platform has been in use now for about a year. Uh, it was built to be smaller and lighter and more suitable for portable operations. But even so, I tend to use it as one of the three standard telescope platforms that I use every night. And I've been very impressed with the quality of the SCAR astrograph. Uh, really well made and the optics are nice and sharp to the edge of the field. And I've gotten some excellent results with it. I paired it up with an Ioptron CM, CM26 mount, which at the time I bought it was probably the uh, smallest and lightest mount out there covering a pretty good uh, payload. Uh, it weighs in at about 10 pounds, but it will handle a 26 pound payload. The scope that I currently have on there right now is probably around 11 pounds. To round out this platform, I mounted a ZWO a ASI 1600mm Pro mono camera third mono camera that I now have in use. For filters, I bought a set of ZWO LRGB filters to cover my broadband needs and a set of Astronomic 6 uh, nanometer wide filters to handle my narrow band needs. I found that I really appreciated having the wider field scope in the collection. My other two scopes uh, have a longer focal length, one with a 920 millimeter range and the other 1080. So having something around 400, which gives me, with this particular camera, a field of view of about 2 by 2.5 two degrees, really opens up what you can do when it comes to composition. And I've been having fun not only uh, taking a picture of larger objects, which aren't suitable for the other scopes, but actually beginning to do group shots where I'm taking multiple targets and getting the framing where, the way I'd like it uh, to be framed, um, which is a degree of freedom I haven't had with the other telescopes. The telescope itself has a rotating portion that allows the camera to be rotated manually. And Sequence Generator Pro, when it's centering its uh, framing, um, also has the ability to allow you to do manual rotation. I figured not having the camera rotator wouldn't be that big a deal because I would be there and I could be the rotator. That turned out not to be such a great experience. What basically happens is it wants to rotate the camera, it tells you that it needs to rotate, it tells you a direction clockwise or counterclockwise, and how far, say 43 degrees. Now it's up to you to decide what 43 degrees looks like since there's no fiducial measures on the telescope. So you try rotating it to that particular position and go through another cycle where it'll take another image, do a plate solve, and come back and tell you, nope, didn't go far enough, go another five degrees. Try it again, and maybe you went overboard, maybe you went seven degrees, and I'll tell you to come back. So this process is not necessarily simple. It happens iteratively, and it's based on how good your estimates are, and it'll keep you hopping back and forth until you've hit some uh, tolerance that you've set in the system for how close you want to be with your angles. Um, this causes you, in the middle of a, of a, of a change in targets, to come out from your nice warm den, go out into the cold or go out into the heat or go out into the mosquitoes and take time fooling around trying to get the rotation down to be what you want it to be. So manual rotation is possible, but it's kind of irritating and it kind of takes time. Uh, more importantly, it's time that I would rather be using in other ways. I use camera rotation for two reasons, composition, um, and also to handle multiple targets in one evening. When I first started with my astrophotographic efforts, I didn't worry about composition too much. I pretty much got the telescope lined up on the center of where the target was, and then I started shooting. Things fell where things fell. Uh, there was enough of a challenge getting that part to work. I didn't worry about composition, but I quickly realized that my images could be improved if I could figure out a way to do that. It was then that I discovered the uh, mosaic and framing wizard that you have uh, you find in uh, Sequence Generator Pro. Now, most people think of it as a tool you would use for doing mosaics, but if you decide you're just working with a single frame, it actually offers a really convenient 
tool for um, doing framing and composition. I'd like to show you how I use Sequence Generator Pro to take full advantage of the camera rotator. Now I don't normally run Sequence Generator Pro on my main processing desktop, but I've installed a trial copy just so I can easily do a video capture of how I use it. When it first opens, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. And in the middle of the screen is a sequence panel, which shows uh, the multiple sequences you may be setting up to run in a particular evening. For right now, we're just going to make that go away. If we look under the Tools menu, we're going to find the Framing and Mosaic Wizard, and we'll pull that up. Let me pull that into the screen. And here is the panel that you're given. The first one really is focusing on allowing you to find the target you're interested in and pulling up a survey chart that allows you to figure out how you want to frame it. Um, we also have a panel that has the camera data. Now normally this would be pulled in from your configuration automatically, but since we're just doing a demo here, let me put in uh, some quick parameters. So the system knows what resolution camera I'm working with. Next, we'll deal with uh, how we draw the rectangle on, this, on the chart to cover the area the camera and telescope combination covers and deals with rotation. And finally, down in here, it talks about what sequence we're going to deal with. Um, to get started, we really need to find the object. Now, I'm going to do something around M5065, so let me just plug that number in. I hit return, and it starts to think about it, and we'll quickly pull up a survey plate of that particular region. Now the contrast is high, but it does give you an idea of where each of the objects are and how you might frame within it. The next step is to just drag a rectangle. And as I drag a rectangle, I get a single rectangle because down in here I've set this up so I'm dealing with one tile by one tile. A lot of people will do two by two or three by three mosaics and you'd have a different number in there, and then you'd have multiple screens to deal with. But I use this most often by just dealing with a single frame one by one, and I use it for composition. First thing you can do is you can move this rectangle around the plate. Uh, this rectangle is a representation of the field of coverage you're gonna have with your, skeleton, your telescope and camera combination, so that's good. Um, but the other degree of freedom you have is the ability to rotate the field. And this is mimicking the ability to rotate the camera. So I could decide how I want to frame this particular image. Now I'm noticing in the triplet here, there is a bridge material coming off one galaxy over here. And I'm thinking I would really like to be able to capture that. So I'm going to play with different rotations to see which seems to look like it might work out best. And I think I'll go all the way down here. And let's say we played with that particular rotation. I can bring this down and I can decide, I kind of like this. I've got the three galaxies and I make sure that I'm covering this plume of material that's coming off of this galaxy. Once you have things where you want, you can press the button here saying to create the sequence. When you do that, you can give it a name and I'm just gonna leave it for M65 for right now. You can tell it you're going to replace targets or append targets in the sequence you're working on. Then in here, you can tell Sequence Generator Pro that when you go to that particular target, you want to slew and then center on that location. And then down in here, that you then want to rotate and validate, validate the camera angle. With that, I'll say OK. And at this point, it brings the sequence panel back up. But you see now that I have a new instance in here. Uh, for M65, and in that instance, if I was to look at it, it will tell me the center location, and it will show me the rotation that's going to be used to line the camera up. I'm then free to go down in here and choose what actions and events I want uh, in my sequence. But this makes it very easy to define a sequence where camera rotation is a critical part of the composition, then when you're running the sequence, it will center um, the field of view um, so that you're where you want to be, and then it will rotate the camera to get the rotation angle that you specified here, and it'll validate that with plate solving. Um, this allows me to have quite a bit of control over how my Im images are framed and their ultimate composition, 
And I can do that from the comfort of a chair in my home in the afternoon, getting ready for the evening where these will be executed. When you have a camera rotator on your system and you start your sequence, everything is automated and everything runs pretty straightforward. The sequence will begin, it will slew to the target, it will verify its location with plate solving, it will adjust as necessary, it will look at the rotation as it needs to change the rotation, it can do so in a very precise way under computer control, um, and it happens very quickly. When I have to do it manually, as I described before, a little bit of hit or miss, a little bit of time, um, it's kind of wasted. Um, it's slow, it's annoying, it's time consuming. Um, with a rotator, it, all that goes away. With a rotator, I could be spending more time collecting subs instead of playing guess that angle. Um, with a rotator, I could be collecting Z's. I could be sleeping while my automated sequence is happening. So I finally decided it was time to put the rotator on, at least to help with that frame. But there's another reason that I would value, I value the rotator. I shoot my images from my driveway, and my driveway has limited view of the sky, mostly because of all the trees on my property. I basically have an open slice of sky going down the driveway, which is facing south. Um, what this does is it presents me with an imaging window for any target that's about three hours, uh, plus or take, depending on where it is, long. Um, that means I have to start my sequence once it's cleared one set of trees, and I'm going to have to shut my sequence down when it hits the other side of the trees. Because I only have two or three hours on a given target, it's not at all unusual for me to have multiple targets that I image each night. Uh, the very first target is handled, then I lose it in the trees, it's time to swap over to the second target, and then I pick that up. And then some nights, especially in the fall when you have very long nights, I can have three targets or maybe even more. Um, so the ability to have a sequence with the rotational elements in to knock down the, the, uh, the composition is really important for me. So that when I do a sequence in one night, let's say I capture three objects, I have three different angles that I have to have on my camera. I need to be able to come back to those angles for two purposes. One is the very next night, I'm never going to do much with only three hours integration time. I need to get as many nights as I can get. But on that second night, I have to be able to bring the camera back to the same rotation um, and the same positioning so that I, I get the same basic framing as I move from target to target. So being able to repeat that, the camera rotator is really very handy. The other thing that's very handy is usually at the end of the night, I tend to write and I shoot my flat calibration files. For each flat calibration files, I want that camera rotated at the same angle it was used when I captured the lights for that particular evening. So the, the rotator handles all of that in an automated fashion. And for me, it's a huge value. Um, I imagine people who have wide open skies who pick one target and go all night, all night long, maybe don't worry about that as much. But for me, having that camera rotator becomes kind of critical. So I decided after doing a lot of hand rotations, it was time to put the camera rotator on this small rig. As far as camera rotators go, I've had excellent luck with the Pegasus Astro Systems uh, Falcon camera uh, rotator. I have two of them on my other rigs, and they are heavy duty, well engineered, have excellent software support, and they function flawlessly. When I've had questions, dealing with a company has been great because they uh, get back to you quickly and they give you very detailed answers, and I've always had a very positive experience. So it's time to get a third one. There was no question in my mind which one I would get. In terms of installing it, I have three issues I have to deal with. The first is a physical install. Um, currently, uh, the Falcon is about 19 millimeters in thickness, so somewhere I have to mount it in my chain and I have to take that, that uh, distance out of the stack of adapters and spacers that I have in the system. So I have to physically mount it. The second thing is I'm going to have to provide power for it and finally a USB connection to be able to control it. So the physical connection was easy because the camera adapter that comes with the Ascar FRA 400 has several layers on it at the different diameters in a cone form and you can take them off. When I took the outer one off, that measured just about 19 millimeters. So it was pretty simple to take that off and then just slide the um, rotator in. 
Um, I did need to get a couple of adapter rings, which I had in my collection. So mounting it went very quickly. It was no problem. Um, in terms of getting power to it, I use the Pegasus Astro uh, Power Box Advanced, and that had two free 12 volt feeds, so that was pretty simple. I just had to connect the wires and then figure out how it's going to hide the wires. Um, and finally, the USB, well, that one I had a bit of a problem with. There was one free USB slot on the Power uh, Box Advanced, and that was a special port that only handles uh, USB 3.0 protocols. Um, what I needed to do was run uh, a USB 2 protocol for this. So that one was not suitable, and all the others were in use. So I ended up buying a very small uh, USB 3.0 uh, rectangular um, uh, hub uh, that I bought through Amazon. And I'll include the information uh, here below uh, on where you can find that. And that worked perfectly. It fit right on. I plugged it into one of the existing USB ports. Uh, routed the other wires into it, and now I have two more ports I can plug things into should I change things in the future. So installing it was relatively straightforward. After I did that, of course, I had to rebalance the entire rig, but it seemed to me that that went very well, and the installation was relatively painless. Uh, what I'd like to do now is just share with you some images of the rig before and after. So first, let's take a look at what the configuration looked like before I made the modifications. Um, this is a pretty packed setup, um, but uh, I'm pretty happy with how I've got things arranged and the cable management for a small rig was looking pretty good. It's kind of hard, hard to hide cables that are coiled in a small rig, but I did find various ways to do that. Now here's a picture of what the final configuration looked like before I had redone the cable management. Not too bad, but um, I had things mounted. Uh, most of the cables were sort of roughly routed. I had to do some more work on that. And finally, let's take a look at what the final configuration looks like with the final cable management. Um, I use the word final in, you know, in parentheses because, of course, uh, cable management is never final, and it's never perfect, and you're always toying with it. I have now had one night where I could take the new configuration out and try it out. And I'm happy to say that it worked flawlessly. Um, there's very little that you have to set up to make the rotator work with Sequence Generator Pro. Um, I set it up the way I set up the other scopes. And when it did the first centering, it automatically rotated, um, did plate solve, uh, did everything I wanted it to do very precisely. Uh, now I have three platforms with rotators. Uh, they all work in a very similar way, which is handy when you're running three platforms. You really like the protocols for each to be consistent, especially when you're sleep deprived and you're in the middle of the night and you're trying to adjust something. You want them all to be working the same with the same software in the same way. And now I have that. And now my rotations happen, happen while I'm snoozing in the house, um, and that's the way things should be. I'd like to thank you for spending some time with us here at Cosgrove's Cosmos. I hope you enjoyed seeing how I've modified one of my rigs. I wish you clear skies and great seeing.